let's recall where we were. We were looking at Lee's algebra, and uh, maybe it would be good to remind us of a couple of things about that algebra. Um, let me write it down for you. Sorry, I'm getting some notes out of the way. So initially, the algebra was described this way. That's the ring. So that x squared equals one and that delta of one is equal to one tensor x plus x tensor one. But delta of x, unlike in the Kovanov algebra, is x tensor x plus one tensor one. And we have that the co-unit behaves by taking x to one and one to zero, as we had seen before. And that this is a Frobenius algebra and this will work to give us, uh, it satisfies the tubing identity, will work to give us uh, <coughs> a homology theory. And, um, and then we might just do a little bit of exercise with that. For example, we, um, we changed uh, basis so that R is equal to one plus X over two and that G is equal to one minus X over two. And that will make epsilon of R equal to one half and epsilon of g equal to minus one half. And then some other identities followed, which we worked on, la we worked out last week, and you can, you can look at them yourself and check them out uh, again if you're interested, but I'll write them down so we have them here. We have that r squared is r, and that g squared is g, and that, of course, r plus g is equal to one. We don't have to use X anymore if we stay in the RG basis if we want to. We have RG equals GR equals zero. And we have that the co-product of R is twice R tensor R. And the co-product of G is equal to minus twice the co-product of G with itself. So, Mm, that's the main thing. And maybe I should write over here along side of everything else, epsilon of one is equal to zero. And then if one wants to, one can work independently with, with these identities and you don't need the X. So then there are some, now this was an exercise and it's in the previous notes probably worked out mostly. And if you wanted to do it yourself, it's interesting to see. It's interesting to see that this really is um, giving you a Frobenius algebra that it behaves right with cobordisms. And, and in fact, it's uh, a nice exercise of which I will do a little piece of it to see the tubing relation in the terms of this algebra, just talking about things that are fun for familiarizing oneself with what's going on with the algebra. So the tubing relation uh, is this, right? But the dot, the dot was X, right? That, that was how we identified it. So, so what is the dot then? Uh, well, or what is X? And um, of course we have that R minus G is X. All right. So that's what the tubing relation then should mean. That you can cut a tube and then you would put a dot here or a dot here that's R minus G. 
or writing it out as an algebraic relation, it says that alpha is equal to epsilon of alpha multiplied by x, which is r minus g times one plus epsilon of alpha, thinking of alpha coming in from the top, multiplied by r minus g, which is x. And so, and so that's what the tubing relation says in the language of R and G for, for the Lie algebra. We're talking about Lie's algebra. And uh, as I said before also, Lee's paper is very nice to read uh, and you will find it in the Dropbox. Um, now, uh, it's it's fun to verify this identity. Uh, for example, let's do just one piece of it and I'll leave the rest to you. Let's try G. <clears throat> try G. For G, it should say that G is equal to epsilon of G times R minus G times one plus epsilon of G times R minus G. So let's... Uh, check the right hand side and see if that works out. Um, so G times R is zero. So this is epsilon of minus G squared, but G squared is G. So this is epsilon of minus G times one plus epsilon of G times R minus G. And what is epsilon of G? Epsilon of G is minus one half. So this would be equal to one half plus minus one half epsilon of G times R minus G. So that would be G minus R over two. But uh, one is R plus G. So this is equal to R plus G plus G minus R over two, which is of course equal to G as desired. So you can check that the tubing relation is satisfied. So let's think about this a little bit for classical knots and see what we can find out about this homology. I'm going to show you an interesting trick, which uh, will get us quite a ways into understanding how this homology works. So I want to show you a little trick for decorating diagrams. We'll work with classical diagrams first, and then we'll figure out how it works for virtual diagrams. But I'm just looking at flat diagrams, and I'm going to think of decorating them with R's and G's in the following way. You go through a crossing and change an R to a G. And if it were labeled here a G, then you would go through the crossing and change the G to an R. So the crossing acts as, a, as an inverter for the value and it just switches it like that, all right? So now let's do an experiment and see what two coloring a classical diagram does when you try coloring it with R and G in that way. R, G, R, G, R, G, R, G, R, G, R. G, R, G, R, G. Um, now I could smooth this. And if I smoothed it, I see that I would be looking at a site in a state with an R and a G across from them, each other. So I would be ending up with, a, with a, an enhanced state. My enhanced states can be labeled with R's and G's, just as they were labeled with X's and ones. I'm just changing basis. Uh, and what happens if I smooth these sites? Well, let's uh, let's do it. So I'll um, do the experiment here. I'll copy this. 
and we'll smooth it. Remember, we're taking color to color. That's how we're smoothing it. Uh, I got too many um, things here. Red became green, I see. Uh, but wait, uh, did we make a mistake? Red became green. And then green became red. It went through the crossing. So that's all right. Yes. Mm -hmm. But something went wrong here. Um, sorry, back up here where we can see what we were doing. Uh, maybe I made a mistake. Red, green, red, green, red, green. Red, green, red, green, red, green. Red, green. Okay, so this should have been green. And that should have been red as it is. Mm -hmm. So red, 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 green, green. All right, so you see what happens is that I'm now getting um, a nice enhanced state of somebody. I mean, we're not worrying about who's over and who's under here um, yet, but this would be an enhanced state. And uh, what about the boundary of this state? Well, if these were, if uh, if these were to be smoothed, then every time I'm looking at boundary, I would be multiplying because this is a disjoint collection of loops. Every single one of these states looks like this. This is your canonical picture, a red loop, a green loop. And so under boundary goes to zero because red times green is equal to zero. Hmm? So in the, in the multiplication table, remember red times green is equal to zero. So, so, the, so this state will have boundary equal to zero. So this is a cycle in the homology. Um, uh, uh, unless they were all Bs or something, but if they were all Bs, it would still be a cycle. Every single site, if it were an A site, will give zero when you take the boundary, right? So it's ineluctably a cycle. So that says that we can get a lot of cycles by coloring the diagrams. And could we, so now we have to ask a further question about this way of thinking about getting cycles. Um, could we, could we perhaps uh, obtain um, two, a cycle that touched itself? If we had a cycle that touched itself, it would touch itself in its same color. In other words, could I find myself in this situation with a self touching cycle? Because if I had a self-touching cycle and it was colored green, then this would go off by boundary equal to the co-product. And um, I guess I've almost already forgotten, and no doubt you have too, uh, that the co-product of green is minus two green tensor green. My co-product of green is minus two green tensor green. So we would get two loops here, green, green, and multiplied by uh, minus two. So <coughs> um, that's what we would have. Uh, uh, and and we, it wouldn't be a cycle. So could it happen that uh, in this construction that I'm showing you of alternating coloring, uh, that we would ever get a cycle uh, that touched itself? So let's investigate uh, this method of getting cycles a little more carefully. Our question is, does this happen?
Mm. Okej. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I think I want to continue working on this board for a moment, and then we'll do another example. I want to orient this diagram and have you look at it. So let's orient the diagram, but maybe it would be good to have a copy of it again for that purpose. Ooh. Alas, but I haven't saved it yet. Number three. Okay. Didn't lose it. I don't mind covering that bit up. All right, now let's orient it. You'll see something interesting. Suppose that I take the oriented smoothings. I'm interested in the oriented smoothings. Those are, those are very well known to us because they are the ones that give the ciphered circles for the spanning surface for a classical knot. So let's look at the ciphered smoothings. Here they are. I'll just do them from the orientation. And back over here, let's draw the smoothings that we were using to get to here. Keeping the colors correctly oriented with one another. You see what happened? They're the same. The color smoothings. Are equal to the cipher smoothings. Now, of course, we went along the diagram as though we were orienting it when we did this red green thing, but we want to see that this is always true. This is a little lemma or a theorem, lemma, right? That the color smoothings are equal to the cipher smoothings for a classical diagram. We'll have to get to virtuals in a few minutes. But for a classical diagram, the color smoothings, the two color smoothings, and the ciphered smoothings are the same. But you see, what is that telling us? That tells us that every time we take a ciphered smoothing, we're going to get a cycle in Lee homology. Ah, not yet. We have to see that there are no places that are self-touching. So let's find out what happens. In other words, I'm saying ciphered circles don't touch themselves. Oh, but you know that. You already know that. So let's let's go slowly so we see what it is we need. I'm on the third one here. We'll 
take it to four. And we've indicated a couple of facts, so we'd better do them in some order. Let's consider, first of all, what's involved. Suppose that I took the simplest case I could imagine. I orient, go around a loop, and I come back. And I started with green, and then I'm red along the loop, and I come back, and I'm uh, green again. And so you see that the, in this case, the cipher smoothing and the color smoothing are identical. We're in a classical diagram. How bad can it be? You went through this once, and then you went through it a second time, and you ended up back at G, of course, because it was even. You went through this twice, once, twice. But, a but the actual situation, the real situation, could be much more complicated. For example, it might be like this, with a lot of other lines going through. And you started here, and you went around, and you came back to here, and you went green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green. And it's still all right. This, the cipher smoothing is the same as the color smoothing because you went through an even number of these, even number of crossings in here. And that's true by the Jordan curve theorem. Right? The Jordan curve theorem says that whenever another line goes in, it must come back out. It will cross through an even number of times. On the other hand, there is something that I didn't include when I was doing that, and that is that this guy might loop through himself a few hundred times before he came back, and then there would be other lines like that. I'll do one. And we went in, and we went out, and we started in red. But now what will happen here? You, well, let's just do one. Green, red. All right, now. I'm going to go through all of this and every one of them I'm going to meet twice, once and then back through again because I'm on along the same loop and I meet it twice. So that means that I will um, in the end go through exactly an even number of things and when I come out of this over here, it'll still be red, you check it. And then it will be green and then it will be red and the smoothing will be color wise. So, so this is the proof that classical diagram implies that color smoothing, smoothings equal cipher smoothings. Okay, so good, we've proved that lemma. And um, when you come to reading the notes again, you should try writing down the real proof rather than just the pictures of, of a proof with the words in the air, but there, there, there it is, okay. Um, now, now, now we're looking at a diagram and we're thinking of its cipher smoothings like this simple trefoil. And we do the cipher smoothing. Which of course might not be as simple as this, but we get a bunch of oriented cycles. And those are called the cipher, cipher circles, right? Can a ciphered circle touch itself? Well, it's an oriented circle, right? So how could an oriented circle touch itself? Well, it would look like this in the plane if it did, right? 
it would be going along and then it would be going along uh but it's not touching itself in an oriented way right so this is not a cipher it's smoothing All ciphered smoothings have the form oriented in the same direction like that. So therefore, no cipher circle touches itself. And therefore, every cipher smoothing is a cycle in Lee homology. Each one does. So you see Lee homology is a lot easier than Kravana homology. It's in the comparison that we're going to get some information. But um, then what we have, in fact, is the following result. Well, let me try stating it the way I want to. Um, just a moment. Uh, one way of stating it would be just this, that if, if L star of K is equal to the Lee homology of K, then the dimension of L star of K, the number of, of surviving cycles, is two to the number of components of K. And why do I say that? Because, because for each component, two cycles for each single component, right? So for example, if you had, if you had this, you could do green, red, green, red, green, red. And then you would have you would have this fellow here, green red, and you would also have red green. You could do it the other way. You could have two choices for each one. So so that we're going to get two for each, but then what about the number of components? Two to the one if there was one component. What happens if you had two components? Well, then it gets a little more interesting. Here, here's here's an example. Because you see, I could go green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red. And then I can also make a choice here, you see, and it could be green or red. So I get two choices there. And if I do green, red, then that gives me a specific one. And we will have the um, corresponding cycle structure here, like that. But you see, if I had done red green, I would have gotten a different cycle structure here. So, so for each for each one of these choices uh, of um, on and on a given component, I get two uh, two new cycles. So I get two times two times two times two uh, the number of components of the link 
cycles in the Lee homology. And, um, and they can look a little different from one another and they are different. And each one gives a specific uh, element in the homology. So the exercise for you is to show Um, or to prove the theorem, that's the exercise. So we proved a lot of this theorem. We've shown how to construct all the cycles. And I'm saying, prove the theorem. So what does it mean to prove the theorem? It means you, you need to show that these are all independent of one another, that, uh, that none of these are boundaries, in other words. You need to show that any given cycle that I construct this way couldn't be a boundary in the Lee homology. So I leave that to you to think about. You'll have to think about how the co-product is working in order to be convinced of that. But you'll see it will work out. And so we know everything about the Lee homology in the classical case. And it has to do with simple coloring of the diagram. Now I'm gonna stay with the classical case and describe how Rasmussen uses this information to get a deep theorem. But any questions so far? Okay. Okay, now it, it, it was fortunate, wasn't it, that we got the ciphered smoothing because the ciphered smoothing is related to the ciphered surface. And I think I should remind us of that before we go any further. Um, I haven't been drawing any crossings here because the, all, everything, um, everything that we've said doesn't terribly much depend on crossings, but let me go back and put in a truffle knot here, because you'll recall that you can form a surface whose boundary is the truffle knot by following Seifert's procedure. Seifert's procedure is you draw the Seifert circuits and then you Take a disk who's uh, take a disk and bound each one of the of the circuits with a disk. And then you add twists. So you put the twist back in like that. With the surface and you get a surface F with the boundary of F. This is the geometric boundary of F is equal to the knot K. So you form disks bounding cipher circuits and you get a surface. So with with that, you see, you can ask whether maybe uh, there is some relationship between the algebra that we're seeing, the fact that each of these is giving us a cycle in the homology 
and the fact that we're getting these cyclic surfaces from the same structure, uh, maybe we can relate the genus of the surface to something about what's going on in the homology. And that is what Rasmussen's idea is. And um, let me try now outlining this for you by using my slideshow, and then we'll come back to drawings when we want to illustrate some things a little more. So, so here is a little outline, uh, which maybe is readable. I hope it's readable. Here's the Lee's algebra. Um, and then remember our grading J. Um, I want to remind you about J. Do you remember J? J was um, equal to, um, the number of B smoothings in the state plus the number of loops that are labeled with an X minus the number of loops that are labeled with a one. Um, now, when you label with the R's and the G's, you are actually labeling with linear combinations. So maybe I should point that out to us before we go any further. If, if I have somebody which is labeled with R, and you'll recall that that meant that it was labeled with one plus X over two, if I recall my R correctly, well, it wasn't minus, it was plus with the R, wasn't it? Yes, okay. So that actually means one half X, one half of, if you like, uh, the curve labeled one, plus the curve labeled X, because X means a curve with a label on it, right? So this is an element in the chain complex. But we can think of labeling a curve with, with R in this way. But then you see that this one would be giving you, uh, this is contributing, this is contributing to, to J equal, um, let's suppose that uh, the number of beads is equal to zero here. Uh, and remember that J is equal to the number of beads plus the number of uh, ones minus the number of X's. So, yeah, that's a, that's the way we define J, we'll keep to it. Um, then you see the J here is going to be equal to, this contributes to J equals to minus one. And this contributes to to j equal to zero in this case. And, and, um, and so you see that when I have one of these multicolored states, like suppose we had r, g, r, and maybe g, r, like that, and then it became this with an r, and this one with a g, then this is a shorthand for um, a one plus X over two here and, uh, and a one minus X over two there. And this is equal to a sum of, um, of various uh, loop, loop labelings from, uh, from one, one, and all the way up to XX. And so you can keep track of it. It has a lot of different gradings in it. Various gradings happening there. So the, the, this coloring idea is a very nice way of packing up what amount to much more complicated description of cycles that are happening in the Lee homology if you use the other algebra. So we, we should keep that in mind. And now we'll go back to this description. 
you can figure out in given an, given an alpha, given some alpha, who, which, is, uh, site, which is in the chain complex, you can compute its boundary. And remember that in the standard Kovanov complex, in the Kovanov complex, J of the boundary of alpha is equal to J of alpha. In fact, that was one of the ways that we found ourselves motivating the algebra itself was that it had to satisfy that. And I remind you how that worked. For example, I might be, let's suppose that I'm again in number of B is equal zero here. Um, and, um, and I have uh, an, a, an A here. And let's suppose that I have a one and a one. And then I, um, um, yeah, uh, and I go by boundary and I go one times one is one, and this became a B. And so the J here is equal to one coming from the one, um, um, yeah. And um, uh, this is one tensor one and the, the A is zero. So that's what we get, we get, um, Oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke myself. The J is equal to the number of ones minus the number of zeros, so it's two. And over here, the J is equal to one plus one, but now it's one B and one one. And here it's two ones, but it's two nonetheless. Count, this count remains the same. So. In the Kovanov complex, we have J, the boundary of alpha is equal to J of alpha. But in the Lie complex, J is not preserved. And that allows us to get information that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise, it turns out, you see we have that j of the boundary of alpha is greater than or equal to j of alpha for each of the chains. The, and you can do some exercises to see what the differences look like. In fact, I recommend that. And when we come back next time, we could look at some examples. Um, so we're going to use that relationship. And now I'm going giving you an outline of Rasmussen's invariant. There are some technicalities under the hood here, um, and maybe we won't even do them, uh, but I am going to tell you how it gets generalized. So one of the things is it's quite natural. You could be sitting here in the complex and you could look at those elements in the complex whose um, J is bigger than something, only I'm going to use, as Rasmussen does, a normalized J, which I'll show you on the next slide. This is the normalized J. It's good old J, but we have shifted it by this quantity. And you may remember, um, uh, too bad I can't write on that, but when I, provide, when I prepare the slides that I'll give you, I'll have these combined. Uh, but let's remember something that we happen to know. We happen to know that we get the invariant Jones polynomial by taking minus one to the n minus, remember this from a while back, times q to the n plus minus two n minus times the bracket of k, where of course the bracket of k is again that special bracket that we're using, which is which has the identity that a crossing goes to the A smoothing minus Q times the B smoothing and the value of the loop is Q plus Q inverse. And this is the normalizing factor that makes this invariant under the Reinemeister moves. And by the same token, it's the right factor to make the chain chains correspond to the 
corresponding chains under the Reitermeister moves. So you change the J, which remember, remember how this worked because this is equal to the sum of Q to the J times uh, the dimension times the, excuse me, I don't want to rush you, but on the other hand, I don't want to go telling too much. So it was the sum of Q to the J times the Euler characteristic of the J homology. Uh, I mean, the Euler characteristic of the J homology. And that means you run over all of the homology in its different homological places, all the different B smoothings, the whole range of the complex, but you stay at a constant J, just as in our calc many calculations from last time. So, um, uh, so this is the this is the bracket that corresponds to the uh, this corresponds to the bracket when we just use J. If we want to make it correspond to the invariant polynomial, we need to shift the gradings further. I'll come back and talk about that at the level of homology at another point. But the point is that once you do that, then you want to use this instead of the J grading, the shift that you needed. And, um, and so we do use that. And then, then you can make the definition as Rasmussen made it of filtering the complex by those things whose grading is bigger than or equal to a given K. And then Rasmussen does the following thing. And I'm, I'm just giving this to you very quickly and maybe we get a chance to look at it more slowly, but you'll see how the end result works in a moment. We take the maximum of these gradings over representatives for the given element in homology. And in a representative, it might be one of our cycles. If there is a maximum, we're going to take it, which means that we might want to take those terms which give rise to the maximum grading in a big sum of terms. And then you take S min to be the minimum of this S over elements in L naught and the maximum as well. So we're off in the zero part of this. And then we take the average of the max and the min. So we're in the all B, all A part of the homology here, okay? Um, and uh, that turns out to be an invariant and um, remarkably so. It turns out that it's a concordance invariant of the knot, which means that if you have an embedding of a tube in four space from one free sphere to another, it will be invariant. Um, and it's additive under connected sum. The, on the mirror image, it changes sign. And if you have an entirely positive knot diagram, then you can show that the invariant is equal to minus r plus n plus one, where r is the number of loops in the ciphered smoothing and n is the number of crossings. And this number here is twice the genus of the ciphered surface. Minus R plus N plus one over two. Is equal to the genus of the ciphered surface. Now we could come back and do an example or two of that in a moment, we will. But then this allowed him to do the following. He could look at a PR, PR torus knot or a PQ torus knot and find that the S of that was P minus one times R minus one, the torus knot that goes P times around the torus one way and R times around the other way. You calculate that S is this. I'll show you how you calculate that. And then the, he can prove that the absolute value of S is less than or equal to twice the genus of the least spanning surface in the four ball. So this gives you a lower bound on the least genus in the four ball that the knot can achieve. So that, that means that G star of the torus knot is less than or equal to P minus one times Q minus one over two. 
but that's the that's the cipher genus all of it so it's already uh greater than or equal to that and therefore it's equal to that and so by this method rasmussen ends up proving that the four ball genus of a torus knot is equal to its cipher genus and that's a conjecture of milner from long ago and this gives a purely combinatorial to topological proof of it via the comparison of Carvana homology and Lee homology. It's the Lee cycles that are going to do the work here to get the estimate. And Milner's conjecture was proved earlier by Kronheimer and Morovka by quite different method, by using gauge theory um, and other kinds of machinery, not by pure combinatorial topology. So this is a very interesting proof. Uh, and we aren't looking here at all the details. I'm telling you about what you have to calculate and it, and maybe we'll talk more about the internal structure of how this works. But let's look a little more closely at it. So I have a, a PQ torus knot and how many crossings are there in a PQ torus knot and what does it look like? Let's go back to our drawing board and think about that. Oh, and what about the cipher surface genus? Let's let's look at the example that we had. Here's our trefoil knot, and here's our cipher circles and the n is equal to the number of crossings and r is equal to the number of cipher circles and we said that the formula was that g is equal to uh, minus R plus N plus one divided by two. So let's see what we get here. Here, N is three and R is two. So minus R plus N plus one divided by two is equal to four minus two over two is one. And indeed, this is genus one. Let's draw a picture of that surface. There's the surface. And you might want to convince yourself that it's a punctured torus. Um, and so I give you an exercise. First of all, uh, another way of drawing it that may be more uh, sympathetic for you, these are just elementary knot theory exercise, um, is uh, to draw it this way, okay? Here I have this out going out as a disc and all around, but it's, it's homeomorphic to this. Um, and then, uh, and then you want to see that this is of genus one or punctured torus. I claim that you can play around with it until you find that it looks like uh, this after some isotopy. And I'll tell you how to do that exercise for fun. I won't show, I won't do the details, but uh, this is another embedding. Oop, I'm running out of room on the board. Okay, still surface, surface. Okay. And this is, uh, this is a punctured torus. So there's some little topological exercise for you. How do you go from here to here 
Um, that's amusing, and I'll just draw you a little hint. You can take the surface and start pushing it down through the crossing until it ends up over here. You can kind of see in shadow what I have and tend to do, and then I will draw the boundaries. But you see, push, push, push until it goes right through there. Um, so then it's going to look like this. And once you see that, now you see that. Now you see that there's this part here where there's a cycle that goes all the way around. And, and what do you see? A 360 degree twist. That's this 360 degree twist. And There's a cycle here that goes underneath and all the way around. And it's another 360 degree twist and it's this cycle here. So by pushing this around by isotopy, you can end up getting to here. And it's easy to see that that's a puncture torus. But how do you prove this in general? Prove this via Euler's formula. Euler's formula says that the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is equal to 2 minus 2g two when you have a decomposition of a surface into vertices, edges, and disc-like faces. And that's what you have here. And you can go look where are the vertices and where are the edges and where are the faces. And in fact, let's do it just so we see how it's going to come about. The vertices is equal to uh, n. And the edges is equal to the number of edges in the knot diagram. But what is the relationship between edges in the knot diagram and uh, vertices. Well, for every vertex, there are four edges. So you have four times the number of edges, four times, excuse me, four times the number of vertices is equal to twice the number of edges. So we have that the number of edges is equal to twice the number of vertices. So, ah, uh, good. Like four here, one, two, three, four, I'm sorry three and six edges. So the number of edges is 2v, which is 2n, okay. And the number of phases, well, that's r, because we're thinking of a close r, r or r plus one? r plus one. Because we're imagining closing it off to make a closed surface to do the genus calculation. So now we put it into Euler's formula and then we get n, minus 2n plus r plus 1 is equal to 2g minus 2. So that says minus n plus r plus 3. Somebody made a mistake. Two minus two g. Yes, I have my signs are backwards here. That was two minus two g, not two g minus two. So we have minus n plus r minus one is equal to minus two g. So that says that g is equal to n minus r plus one divided by two. And if I'm lucky, I got to the formula that I was telling you at the beginning, n minus r plus one divided by two, okay? So 
Um, so on the one hand, by Euler's formula, you can find what the genus is for the cyclic surface. And on the other hand, it's of course interesting to see how it works out in actual practice and embedded practice. So, so this is what we have. Now, getting back to the torus knot, Oh, I want to show you a picture of a torus knot. So let's, um, so we can see what goes on there. Let's say we take a, um, a 4-3, a K-4-3. So so this is four lines and a crossover. And um, I'm going to do three of these. and wrap it around. And then, Uh, somebody uh, confused themselves just now in the second round there. What did I do? Sorry about that. Start again. Okay, so there is a 4-3 torus knot. And as you see, it's on a torus. This part goes over the top, it goes underneath, goes over the top, goes underneath, goes around four times one way and three times the other way. Um, it all goes this way. So if you were orienting, you see it's all oriented around like this. So all the crossings are positive. And these are all A smoothings. So, um, so you see that in this case, the cycle that we would get in the Lee homology is, that, is in L0, right? And we just smooth all those guys and we will, we will have our Lee cycle. And um, we might as well um, operate on it on the next page, yeah?
So if we smooth each one of these, we'll have the cyclic circles, and we will also have the Lee cycle. So you see the cyclic circles are very well controlled collection of things. And we have, we were, we're looking at a K34 or K43, K43. Um, and we have four of these cycles, P. Um, and, um, and um, everything is in order here. So now compare that with what I wrote and let's see if it makes sense. I say that um, there are, how many crossings did we have in this knot? Right. Um, well, um, uh, let's go back one slide. One, two, three. This is from the four piece, you see, four lines, three pieces. So what is happening is that when you have the KPQ, you're going to have P minus one times Q, Q being, this is the K43. Um, you're gonna see three times three is nine, right? But in general, P minus one times Q crossings. Uh, and we're going to have P, cipher circles. So I hope that's now evident by looking at these drawings of the torus knots, what we're going to get here. And now if we go back to the calculation in my slide, I said, we're going to have P loops and P minus one times Q crossings. And what would be the Q of the state involved? Well, the Q was, you have to remember what that Q was. The Q was J plus N plus minus two N minus. They're all plus. So the N part here is P times Q minus one. And the J, well, the J is the number of loops because I can get that as high as I like, right? So if I wanna get it all the way uh, or as low as I like, and um, I'm, I'm looking at the lowest value I can get here. So I take the minus P. Um, I'm, I'm looking at that part, uh, the lowest J I can get. Um, and, um, and so you see that I get P minus one times Q minus one minus one. And we end up with the S is equal to P minus one times Q minus one. Now we need to go back to the other slide to see what was going on there. We're, we're taking, it turns out that the max uh, and the min are related by us, by their differences too. Uh, and we could look at the min and we're looking at the min. And the min is the min of Q. So I was minimizing Q and then I added one to it in order to get to the, to the Rasmussen prescription. So, of course, it seems a bit mysterious because we haven't gone through the justification that this is an invariant, but I'm showing you how it will calculate out. And so what we found here was that the, by looking at where the grading landed, we found that the grading was landing on um, an S that would give us P minus one times Q minus one. And that is exactly what Rasmussen wants. That's what tells him that his invariant is twice is twice the cipher genus, and it's bounding below something, uh, and that proves that the cipher genus is equal to the four ball genus in the case of torus knots. So that's how it looks, and and you see how it's all driven by it's all driven by um, what the 
estimates are on the kind of degrees that can be produced by the uh, Lee states on the on this knot, because the Lee states correspond to the cipher circles. And then we have this nice little Lee state, or a couple of them, green, blue, red, green, red, uh, working nicely. Uh, and it's in the comparison of the gradings that come off of that Lee state and the gradings in the Corvano homology that this result gets proved. So I hope that gives you the beginning of a feel for how uh, Rasmussen's invariant works. And now I want to talk about a couple of things that we'll continue with. And one of them is how we will work the Lee homology when we're working with virtual. So let's let's think about that for a moment. We'll go back to the states of the Lee homology. So mm, let's take a virtual diagram and, and, and play with Lee states on a virtual diagram. Okay. Well, I can do the same game I played before. Let's see what will happen. I could true red and green and red and red and green and red. And that you'll find is all, of course, when I, when I send colors through a virtual crossing, I don't do anything. But if I do this and I compare this with the Seifert state, you are going to see that it isn't quite the same, right? I can color this, but if I look at the coloring smoothing, in this case, it's different in both of these crossings from the Seifert smoothing. So I'm not going to be labeling the Seifert state. Ah, but we also know that this homology theory is really not going to work unless I have the cut points in. We're going to be looking at, we will look at Lee homology for virtuals. via the same yoga with cut points and involutions as for Kovana homology for virtuals. So let's put our cut points back in and see what happens then. Now I tell you that we don't have time today, but I'll talk about it tomorrow. I mean, next week. Um, there, this, this, this goes off in the direction of other invariants. And we'll come back to them. Um, an invariant that I call binary bracket. where I don't use this cut point situation. And we get uh, other invariants, invariants of virtual knots that are related to these colored states. And which is certainly very interesting and is related in fact, and that is related to Rushworth. Rushworth's doubled Kovana homology, but I'm getting ahead of my story if I wanted to tell you about that. I would be getting in back and in head because the invariants that I found, binary bracket, uh, were found be long before Rushworth, but Rushworth 
turns out to be categorifying that invariant at the Lee homology level, and we'll talk about that. But, but, but what, what is amazing is what's about to happen when we put in our corrections for virtual Kovanov homology. You'll see, watch. So what are our corrections? Remember what they were? You, um, you have an oriented crossing. And then you're going to make a source sink. By keeping the right-hand side as it is, but making a source sink. So this goes out and this goes in. And then you should have some cut points. And one way to have the cut points quite normal it lies is to just put them right there, right there, okay? And then it continues going out uh, or in as the case may be, just as it did before. And this is where our cut points are. So this is the canonical, cut point assignment. And then we're going to do our homology with respect to how many, how accounting, how things cross through the cut points, remember? And also we're going to keep track of, of orders. But for today, I will ignore the orders. And if they happen to come up in an, in an example, I will, I will worry it, but, uh, um, but there is also plus local to global order. But we're just going to concentrate on the cut point structure. So let's do an example and see how that makes the cut points work. Um, take the virtual trefoil here. oriented. And then actually, you see, I don't even have to put these reverse arrows. I just know, um, I'll do it in red, that on the right, I leave it alone. And here I put a pair of cut points. And on the right, I leave it alone. And here I put a pair of cut points. And then um, whenever you have, whenever you have, consecutive cut points. Well, what does that mean? That means that it was going like this, then it went like that, and then it went like that. And this is equivalent to no cut points at all. So, so uh, and that's the way our formalism works because we do an involution, then we do another involution. So, so this is equivalent to Do this. Mm -hmm. Well, it's familiar from before, right? Um, and and you can take it now to mean that we now have the following rules for things with cut points in them. If you have green on this side, it turns into red on this side, and if you have red on this side, it should turn into green on this side. And by the way, that is in fact our involution because what is our involution applied to x plus one divided by two? You remember the involution on x was minus x. So this is equal to minus x plus one divided by two. So that says that the involution applied to red is equal to green. And of course, the involution applied to green is equal to red. Or in other words, red bar equals green and green bar is equal to red. So the Lee homology has our involution in the exchange of green and red. 
and now we and now we have a new uh, new way to think of coloring our diagrams. We color them with cut points on them, and um, and we we switch colors as we go across a crossing, and we switch colors as we go across a cut point. So, for example, here I would have green, then red. Red goes up to here. That becomes green, but green meets a crossing and becomes red. Red meets a crossing and becomes green, and green becomes red. And red goes over here. And now let's look at the color, the color smoothings. And you see they are now corrected. They're the same as the cipher smoothings. So I've just illustrated another lemma. The lemma is that after cut points, color smoothings, equal cipher smoothings. So you see, this tells us that we are home, <coughs> that, uh, that what we would hope to do, which would be to generalize the Rasmussen situation into virtual knot theory, is likely to work because we are going to have cycles for the same reason that we had them before in the Lee homology. And those cycles are going to correspond to the ciphered smoothings of the diagrams. But it isn't all uh, as simple as it was in the classical case, not all. Um, let's. Um, Let's go to another slide so we can draw this picture a little better. Let's take that picture that we were just looking at. And we had a cut point there and we had a cut point there and we were going along and we said, mm, well, I don't remember what the colors were, but suppose this is red, then this would be green, green, red, uh, red becomes green, green becomes red, and red becomes green. And we are. Um, and, and then we're going to take a smoothing here, and we're going to take a smoothing there. And if we do that to get the corresponding state, Then in this case, as you see, um, I have a single cycle state. And if I have a single cycle state, uh, well, um, the, the boundary map on a single cycle state is going, we still have that the single cycle map is equal to zero, right? That was our principle before in doing virtual Kovanov homology, and it is here as well. So this is still a cycle. You see, so uh, I don't actually run into trouble, but you might have worried about it. I don't run into trouble. I'll still have my cycles, sometimes for the reason that something is self-touching, but self-touching comes about because of single cycle phenomena and it goes to zero. Um, and sometimes for the other reason. But the basic, uh, the basic result then is that, uh, is that Rasmussen generalizes.
and it generalizes to the same result. for positive virtuals. And again, it's for the same reasons, you see. When you have a positive crossing, uh, then it's an A smoothing, right? And so if you have a positive virtual, then you have an A smoothing state, which gives you a cycle right down there in L0. Um, and then you can, repeat most of what happens in the Rasmussen invariant the same way, and the same issues come up, and you can compare with the genus of the cipher surface. And then um, we're almost done time-wise, so I just want to uh, now go back and remind you, so you have the whole picture and we'll look at some of this in more detail. I want to remind you about cipher sur surfaces for virtuals. This is something we talked about before, but now, sorry, I'm having a little trouble moving these things around. There it is, okay. We talked about this before, about how there is a cipher surface for a virtual, if you're willing to think of it as being in the four ball. And um, so let's re just review that uh, to tell to complete the story that I'm telling you about. So. The story, this is a very pleasant piece of the story, and it actually is quite pleasant and surprising how all these different um, small things, uh, combinatorial things or topological things fit together, like the way you just saw how uh, by correcting by cut points, we ended up going back to uh, cycles that actually corresponded to standard cipher smoothings and other things that happened in this talk. There are a whole number of coincidences that are uh, coming together to make what we're talking about work. So if we go back to the virtual cipher, to the cipher surface, we formed it this way. You form the cipher circles and then you put in the twists. But another way of thinking about it is here's my classical knot and I'm going to go through a cobordism. I will go through a saddle point here, a saddle point there. Those are un oppositely oriented and I go through a saddle point. And so for every crossing, I'll pick up a little extra curl, but otherwise I'm getting the cipher circles. They're just the cipher circles. And then I bound them off with disks into the four ball and I get a surface in, into the four ball whose boundary is the knot. Fine. But you see, this we can do with a cipher, we, we can do with a virtual knot. I can go through a cobordism here and here and get to what amount to the cipher circles for the virtual knot. And this surface has a meaning. Uh, if I were to just smooth out these crossings, uh, I would get a funny picture and I wouldn't know what the meaning of it was. But now looking at it from the four dimensional point of view, it is a cobordism, which takes me to some trivial uh, circles that can be bounded off. And so from the point of view of virtual not cobordism, we form a surface this way. And it, we call it the virtual ciphered surface and the genus of it by the same order characteristic argument as before is equal to one half of minus R plus N plus one. So you see that all those ingredients can fit together. And we're going to find that exactly as before that the, um, that the grading estimate for the Lee cycle that corresponds to that guy uh, will be correct and will give rise to the genus of the spanning surface. And that's where I'll start next time in talking about this situation. Uh, so this is probably a good point, a good place to stop. So I've shown you a lot of examples today, some, um, some deductive things and the basic connection by which we can work on our generalization of the Rasmussen invariant to virtual knots. I'll stop.